Hi, everybody. Welcome to Connecting with Americans on Climate Change, hosted by the MIT Environmental Solutions Initiative as part of its People, Prosperity, and the Planet event series. We are very glad you're here. We had an incredible amount of enthusiasm for this event with almost 400 people registering. And that just goes to show how much interest there is in reaching across the divides that exist in America today and in accelerating meaningful action on climate change. I am Lar Hesse Fisher. I'm from the MIT Environmental Solutions Initiative, and I lead our work on climate change engagement and communications. And the ESI, the Environmental Solutions Initiative, leads MIT's work on sustainability education, natural climate solutions, mining and sustainability, plastics and the environment, and climate education and uh, communications, and much, much more. You can learn more about the Environmental Solutions Initiative at our website, environmentalsolutions.mit.edu. And as part of our outreach and engagement, we are committed to providing the public with clear, easily accessible, nonpartisan information on climate change. We run a platinum award-winning podcast and a Webby award-winning website on climate, which you can find at climate.mit.edu. But not all Americans are curious about climate change. In fact, many resist even talking about it, which is what brings us to our event today. ESI runs a project called Here and Real that partners with local leaders and organizations and takes the time to understand people's hopes and fears and values to help break through political stalemate and advance climate solutions that work for everyone. A part of this work is our Environmental Solutions Journalism Fellowship, which we are featuring in today's event. Earlier this year, we held a competitive call for proposals from journalists in key parts of the country and selected five fellows to pursue their projects over four months to be published through their affiliated newsrooms. Their projects lead with issues that are already important to their audience and then weave in how climate change is impacting those concerns or creating new opportunities. And you'll get to meet and hear from our fellows today. We have a great set of conversations for you. In a moment, I will invite our presenting speaker, Professor Arlie Russell Hochschild, to speak on the role that bridge building plays in climate action. And then we'll hear from our five journalism fellows about the approaches that they took in their projects. And we'll have time for Q&A at the end, wrapping up at about 15 minutes past the hour. Uh, so some logistics. First, can you please submit your questions in the Q&A feature in Zoom? You'll see there on, on the bar at the bottom. Um, if you put them in the chat, we might miss them. So please do put it in the Q&A feature. It's uh, easier for us to manage them there. I also want to quickly acknowledge the over 100 MIT alumni who are here with us today. Thank you to them and all of our other supporters who help us run programs like this journalism fellowship. And we are currently fundraising to support our 2020 cohort of fellows. And if you would like to contribute, you can email me climate at mit.edu, or you can visit esi.mit.edu slash donate. Okay, so those are all the logistics and we are ready to dive into our conversation. So it is now my distinct pleasure to introduce our presenting speaker, Professor Arlie Russell Hochschild. Professor Hochschild is an Emerita Professor of Sociology at the University of California, Berkeley, and author of several books, including Strangers in Their Own Land, Anger and Mourning on the American Right, which was a finalist for the National Book Award and a New York Times bestseller. Professor Hochschild, thank you so much for joining us here today. Well, it's my great pleasure. It's a very important topic here. Yeah. Well, I, I invited you to be our guest, our special guest for this event because I admire your work so much. <laughs> for, for, for me, your, your approach to engagement is, it's an exemplar of how to meaningfully build bridges with people who have different perspectives than we do. So here's my setup for my first question. It's especially for people who might not be as familiar with your work. So you are a liberal, feminist, Californian academic who spent five years interviewing Tea Partiers in Louisiana. 
many of whom you strongly disagreed with on different issues, and you wrote a book about them, and the book helps readers understand their perspectives. And you stayed friends with several of the people that you interviewed, the Tea Partiers. You've gone over to their house for dinner and you keep in touch. Did I characterize that correctly? Yeah, they're, they're now visiting me. Oh, that's great. That's great. <laughs> so, but there, there's like a counterpoint or a counter argument to doing this work, which is, you know, what's the point? Why make such an effort to build bridges, especially if, you know, the other side isn't trying to reach across? Yeah. Yeah. Um... And I hear that, but you know, this topic, uh, climate and uh, this and reach across, putting those two things together couldn't be more urgent. And it's not just urgent because there are new floods and famines and climate refugees coming than we already have. It's, it's urgent for that reason, but it's also urgent because there's a rise in right-wing populism, which is equal and opposite. And it's got leaders like Trump and uh, that are opposed to doing anything uh, about climate. So we've got to face that. And it is urgent, the facing of it. It's the hardest part in a way. And, um, you know, if you go to places, especially uh, where like coal jobs have been lost, and uh, people are saying, look, uh, you know, we're looked down on and we're, uh, we're denigrated and uh, we're hurting and the government hasn't done anything. Uh, good jobs are out. No good jobs are back in. Opiates are uh, coming in strong. What are you people, you know, you're on the other side. So, uh, and, and that's a, uh, tinder, dry tinder that a politician can easily light. So in a way, we need people who are uh, really informed about climate, who are good at making common cause around differences. And that is the challenge. It's doable and it's important. So let's talk a little bit about the doability part of it. Um, I, I really want to get at why you look at the things the way that you do. And you are a sociologist. So I'm curious, how has the field of sociology informed the way that you approach engaging with people who are different than you about these tricky topics? Sociology gives us forgiveness. And it gets uh, guilt and blame out of the picture. It doesn't get judgment all the way out of the picture, of course. But you began to to look at someone at, from the point of view of how they were formed. And so when I went down to Louisiana for five years of having a look and had dinner with people and saw how they, uh, what they did during their day and, and where their kin were buried and what school they went to and uh, what was uh, fun for them, what was embarrassing for them, uh, I could get a sense in the back of my mind, the sociology part of that was, okay, globalization has winners and losers. Who am I talking to here? From the 70s on with offshoring good jobs and automation, it hit the blue collar across the country, but especially in, in these one industry towns, you know, that that's who I'm talking to. I'm talking to the elite of the left behind. And I think around the world, that's who the right, that's who the energized populist right is. Okay, that's sociology that told me. I'm not just talking to a person, they're located somewhere. And, and I'm going to have to tune an ear to how they hear and what their symbols are. And like, for example, I found that when talking about climate, if you if you say, oh, well, it's man-made, you know, that ticks off in their mind guilt. Oh, you mean I come up dirty from the coal mine and uh, I'm causing this big problem? No. So you don't, you don't go there. You say, well, okay, you're a hunter and a fisher and uh, isn't it great to be able to eat the game, you know, and, and uh, that it won't be contaminated and 
you know, no, uh, no dust in the sky. Uh, and how about solar? Wonderful. Yeah. So that if you if you go to the solution, you you get instant agreement actually on that. So you only know that by listening for the for the symbols and the, to tick them off. We've got ours too, by the way. <laughs> Um, I, I love that, I, listening to how other people hear. And I'm also touched by what you said about it's not just a person, they exist inside of a context. You have something called a, a deep story. A person holds a deep story. Can you share a little bit about what that context or what, what that word means, that concept means? Yeah, you know, um, I came to feel after listening, doing a lot of open listening, I took my alarm system off and, and tried to really open listen. And I had a feeling it all boils down into a way to feelings and to a story that evokes those feelings and the deep story uh, in Strangers in Their Own Land, which is the right wing deep story. We've got ours, but uh, the right wing deep story is you're waiting in line uh, facing the American dream. And it's, um, you feel like, the line is endless, that you're not very far ahead in it. It hasn't moved. People haven't had raises in 20 years. And you're then you see line cutters. Well, who would that be? That would be blacks and women who finally are given access to jobs that have been reserved for whites and men. And you feel what well, they're pushing me back. And then you see environmentalists and people who want the regulation. Well, they're pulling ahead too. And then you see refugees and you see immigrants. And then you see Barack Obama waving to those uh, line cutters as you, the right wing, a deep story person feel. And then you feel I'm not represented. I'm out, I'm a stranger in my own land. So you take facts out of the deep story, you take moral precepts out. It's just that distillation of feeling. And we have to learn to talk deep story to deep story. Okay, so then what's, what's the first step? How do you go about listening to how other people hear and trying to get a sense of what a person's deep story is to, to start building that connection? Well, when I was... Uh, meeting people uh, at the Republican Women of Southwest Louisiana uh, annual dinner with a uh, rifle a raffle, <laughs> you know, at the Lord's Prayer to begin with. And, and I, uh, people would ask me, what are you doing here? You know, who are you? Well, I, you know, I'd first say, well, hi, I'm a retired uh, professor of sociology, UC, University of California, Berkeley. I told them exactly what I was, and I'm here because I don't, well, then they would say, ooh, Berkeley, oh. And then I would say, but you know, the reason I'm here is that I feel like there's a big division in the country and I don't, I've never been in the South. I've never lived here. I don't understand. I don't know any members of the Tea Party. And I'm, I'm here to try and learn about me. And they would say, oh, well, we're worried about the divide too. But we think it's because you people look down on us and you think we're backward and racist and you know that's what you think. And I said, well, that's I'm you're doing me a favor. I'm so grateful just to get to know you. So there was one crossover issue, the divide. So it sounds like when you entered those conversations, you came in with an incredible amount of honesty. You just said, this is who I am, this is what I'm doing. I'm not trying to dupe you. And you also came in with a lot of curiosity. It sounds like there was an authentic level of curiosity there of, of really trying to understand as opposed to convince or change minds. Yes, that's true. And uh, humor helps a lot. Uh, I uh, said so I came from Berkeley, California. One uh, Tea Party uh, Louisiana guy said to me, oh, y'all communist, right? And I just let it go and laugh, and he laughed too. I thought, okay, <laughs> this can work. He's laughing. Yeah, we'll we'll go forward. But uh, yeah, sometimes it just takes standing there. 
you know, honestly, just they will have their projections upon you. And um, they don't bother you. You're going under that. Did you ever get to a point in the conversation where you were trying to persuade somebody or where you were trying to make a point and 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 do more than just listen? Yes. And then I always thought it was a mistake. Can you say more about that? Yeah. I think there's a ultimately the purpose, of course, is to get communication going and through the symbol system of the other side, you don't want to stumble on that. That's what you're listening for. What can this other person hear that I can say? I'm not interested in just saying it. I, I'm interested in what they can hear. And I'm, I'm, uh, I'm studying other people who are good at knowing their hearing and getting the point across. That's, that's my focus. Um, and I stumbled, sure, sure, I'm a human. <laughs> uh, and in the book, of course, I, you do know what I think. What I thought was really interesting is once you had identified what you thought was the deep story, then you went back to the people that you had connected with. And you said, is this it? Did I, did I get it right? And they gave you feedback on it. They did. Some said, you read my mind. Uh, one guy said, I live your metaphor. And others said, no, look, you, it's incomplete. You know, one woman said, yeah, but uh, uh, it's actually the people waiting in line who are paying taxes that go to the line cutters. That was what you left that out. So I put that in. Yeah, they helped me finish it to tell their vision. Yeah. So I'm really excited that in a moment, we're going to be introducing our journalism fellows um, who have spent four months working on projects that try to do some of this listening, right? That weave climate change with local priorities in order to engage some new audiences or engage some new conversations about climate change. So what role do you see efforts like this journalism fellowship and your book and maybe other efforts that are out there in advancing this larger strategy of accelerating action on climate change and environmental issues? I think it just, I, it couldn't be more important. I honestly uh, think of the researchers we're going to meet uh, today as uh, first responders to, to a crisis. And uh, it's a crisis that curiously isn't being directly uh, addressed because People who are really um, concerned about climate or doing research on it are often in a bubble, and, and we are all in bubbles. And so what I see this project doing, what this feels so special to me about these five researchers and, um, and, and project developers uh, is that they're getting out of the bubble. Oh, well, thank you so much uh, for this conversation. Of course, we could go on for another hour, but unfortunately, we don't have the time to do that right now. But you are staying around with us and helping us lead our next session, which I'm very grateful for. Um, so I just want to take this moment to, to transition and introduce our, our five fellows. So over the last five months, Tristan, Dustin, Nora, Melba, and Alex have pursued a variety of stories that link some of their region's most pressing issues with climate change. And their pieces have been published or will soon be published through their affiliated local paper. And we are going to play a three minute video that will introduce them and their work and then we'll turn it over to them. Okay, let's roll it. I'm Tristan Bowrick, an environment reporter with the Times-Picayune in New Orleans. Louisiana's oil and gas industry has caused many of the environmental problems the state faces today, and now the industry is fading, leaving many people without jobs. My project highlights Louisiana's offshore wind energy potential, both as an economic engine and a way to produce renewable energy. 
This project deepened my understanding of both the fossil fuel industry and the renewable energy industries. And with that deepened knowledge, I, I plan to cover both um, a lot more in the future. Hi, my name is Dustin Blyzeffer, and I'm a reporter for wildfile.com, and I'm based in Casper, Wyoming. My project aims to advance the understanding of what transitioning away from coal might mean for wild communities. The project also aims to create a better understanding of the climate change that's happening in the world and what are some ways to help preserve the wine quality of life within those big changes. My name is Nora Hurdle. I'm a reporter with the St. Cloud Times in central Minnesota. Um, there's a lot of enthusiasm in Minnesota and across the United States for natural climate solutions. Practices in agriculture and forestry have the potential to draw excess carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and deposit it into the soil, into trees and other plants, but it's not a cheap or a simple or quick transition. My project looks at the complexity in carbon sequestration efforts and also features people who are uh, working to combat climate change a few hundred acres at a time. Hi, my name is Melba Newsom. I'm an independent journalist in Charlotte, North Carolina. Many people in the state, especially those in the coastal plains, believe that they have to choose between protecting the environment and protecting their way of life. My project seeks to explain that unless we confront climate change head on, their way of life is already over. Hi, I'm Alex Schwartz and I'm a reporter with the Herald and News in Klamath Falls, Oregon. Tribes, farmers, ranchers, and environmental groups have been fighting over water in the overdeveloped, overallocated Klamath River Basin for decades now. In an area where so much discussion hinges on people's interpretation of the past, I hope to provide stakeholders with a positive, balanced vision for the future. Great, thank you for that. I am very excited now for you to hear from our fellows. And this part of the conversation will be led by Professor Hochschild. So please take it away. Yeah. Great, I am very excited to uh, hear from the fellows. And um, let me start by asking uh, you, Alex, uh, Dustin and Melba. Um, each of you reported on the impacts of climate change in the region you chose through the lens of a particular local issue. Can you share with us about your approach and uh, why you took the approach you did? Sure, I can. I could start with that. Um, you know, the the issue that I was dealing with is that you know the the water crisis that I cover has been in, set in motion long before uh, climate change actually started sort of rearing its head. Um, and, you know, as a result, the situation is already so bad that there, you know, you have a lot of folks who don't even want to think about it possibly getting worse due to climate change. Um, you know, people haven't really analyzed the the specific local impacts of this crisis. You know, maybe they know about Florida getting hit by hurricanes or, you know, sea level rising in New York, but they're not really super clear on how, for example, the snowpack in the Cascade Mountains is changing or, you know, how stream flows on the river, you know, in their backyard is adjusting. Um, so I think adding the, and, the, you know, and most importantly, they don't really have the data to look at that either. So my, you know, part of my goal was trying to provide that information to people to, to make them a little bit more informed about the future that we're facing and, and the impacts that we've already seen. So you would say that uh, people said, look, we've already had bad news. It's always been like this. And Florida is another story. Uh, are there things they could observe if you pointed them to it? 
Yeah, no. And there were, you know, there were people I talked to where I asked, you know, what have you seen in, you know, anecdotally in your own life, maybe something that isn't supported by data. And, you know, people talk about the snow banks that used to be, you know, nine feet tall in town, and now we just don't get snow anymore. And uh, it's, it, it's kind of, you know, those sort of uh, anecdotal examples have been really helpful in, in terms of, you know, connecting with people on this topic. Tuning them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Dustin, um, so uh, the same question for you. Uh, what, uh, what determined, tell us about what you found and what determined your approach? Yeah, well, um, climate change can be a really difficult topic uh, to talk about in Wyoming. It's, um, it's very divisive uh, and usually talked about in terms of politics. Um, but, and, and, and it's often thought about as a problem somewhere else, um, that uh, governments and regions and other states are imposing changes on Wyoming, you know, uh, you know because they're not going to buy our coal anymore, or, you know, they're, they're imposing these policies that come to play uh, very prominently in Wyoming's economy. So the approach I took was to, uh, to ask people to like, let, let's go to a place, uh, a landscape that you love. Because, you know, one thing we all identify with in Wyoming is we, we love these vast outdoors, you know, these basin areas and mountains. We have a lot of public lands in Wyoming. And even if you work in a coal mine or a trona mine or the oil patch, a lot of those folks work those jobs because it affords them the opportunity to go enjoy those lands, right? Hunting, fishing, and skiing. And so I, what I thought I'd do is, is kind of back up a little bit. And I asked people, like, let's go to a landscape that you love or depend on. And just tell me about what you're observing. What changes are you seeing? And, and they are seeing changes. And a, lot of, a lot of the time they attribute that to drought and, uh, but they see changes that uh, seem to be, you know, just, they don't fall in line with the cycles that they knew about when they were younger. Mm -hmm. And so uh, you know, I, I thought that was a good starting point. You know, we can talk about these, you know, the North Platte River where a lot of people fish or these basin areas where a lot of people go hunt. And, and that's a huge part of their quality of life and why they live here. And then, um, you know, a, in an accompanying story, I thought, okay, well, let's talk about the climate data that's specific to Wyoming. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and let's start having that conversation. And, and what is that telling us? You know? Fantastic, fantastic. Melba, let me uh, turn to you. And I would uh, love to know, um, how you approached uh, your project and uh, whether you found a kind of a common ground wedge uh, like Dustin did. Well, I, I did. I reported uh, my project was centered in Eastern North Carolina, which is the agricultural and industrial farming hub and of the state. And the people there are experiencing a lot because it's the coastal region and they are experiencing a lot of uh, effects of climate change. And uh, so it's not as far removed as it once was, like a report, the, the state issued a report talking about sea level rise and you know the impact. So it doesn't feel so remote to them. So that was a good, that was a good place to start, but I, I spent a lot of time talking to the people who are impacted by industry. And, you know, they used to say, because that part with the um, feeding operations and all the industrial farms, the poultry and the hog farm, it, it, it's really um, polluting and it smells really bad. And they used to say, well, you smell that? That's the smell of money. 
Well, they don't say that anymore because 30 years later, the same people have the money <laughs> and they just have the residual effects. And I, it, it, it is really, it was really good to see that there's kind of been a melding of the conservation movement and the people talking about environmental racism and environmental justice because they see their futures tied together and to, you know, that they're stronger if they uh, we kind of unite and discuss these issues and lobby against them and try to bring about change in that way. So that was very interesting. Yeah, it's interesting, the smell of money. I heard that too in uh, Lake Charles and yes. uh, the very same thing when they, the smell of, uh, you know, a chemical, oh no, smell of money. Right. But they, it sounds like uh, for you, Melba, that uh, what you found is people didn't need to be convinced uh, that uh, there was something really wrong and they wanted to change it, but a feeling efficacious, how do we do it? Is that, is that right? Or... That's, that's absolutely true, is what can we do when you know, we have legislators from the great state of uh, Purdue chicken and the, you know, the great state of Smithfield. And that's, they, it doesn't matter what happens. That's how they're going to vote. That's what they're going to do. So they're like, what can I do, you know, to change these things? And, and there are other people who are opposed because of maybe f of doing anything. They, they don't want to talk about climate change they, because it, to them, it's like, you're going to come down here and tell us, you know, what to do in our communities and, and, you know, impose these things. But the people who mostly say that, they don't live near the CAFO. <laughs> they don't get that money smell all the time, right? So, and um, they're, so they think it's kind of worth it. It's, it, it's basically what can we do? And there is a bit of kind of, uh, you know, they feel overwhelmed that nobody's listening because, you know, the money is on the other side. Right, right. So this would seem to call for a different kind of approach. You've got people who understand it, but uh, feel powerless. Wonderful. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, Nora and Tristan, your projects are uh, focused on uh, climate solutions and how they're playing in your region. Can you uh, share your projects and what uh, breakthrough ways in your community to relate to climate? Yeah, I'll, I'll go first. Um, carbon markets were a really good entry point um, because uh, they are a market-based solution. So people on both sides of the political spectrum um, could get behind it. Um, it's not really controversial. I mean, well, certainly there there is, if you look hard enough, you can find some people who aren't fans, but uh, generally speaking, people who wouldn't normally be talking about climate change are interested in carbon markets because there's um, a mechanism for them to get paid. And there's talk about carbon as a crop that you um, sequester carbon through um, planting cover crops on your land or through limiting your tilling practices, um, which would keep carbon locked in the soil. Um, those kinds of practices, even also um, grazing livestock on the land, those practices, um, some farmers do them anyway, um, but there's these emerging carbon markets where they can get paid to do it. So they're not just doing it because um, it's a conservation practice or because there's a little bit of government money or regulatory pressure, but because there's um, money coming from a business and that it's it, they can include it as um, uh, an operation expense and get revenue for it. Um, so it's an easier sell. It, it is, yeah. It, it's not controversial in that way. And you know, I, my hope is that 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 kind of takes off. I mean, it's not. There's there's a lot of. Um, it's kind of the Wild West, as some of the folks um, that I interviewed described it, um, because there's not a lot of regulation, but there's a lot of demand from corporations who want to, to be, mark, uh, be carbon neutral. So they want, they need someone out there and working in forestry or 
working in agriculture to be responsible for storing more carbon. Um, so there's that, there's that demand there. Um, and, and farmers, I think, should get paid for doing that because it, it costs money to buy seeds for cover crops. They might need to buy new equipment to um, make these practices. And there's a lot of benefit for all of us. Um, there's biodiversity benefits. There's, um, uh, there's benefits to the soil. It helps us all adapt to climate change. Great, great, thank you. Uh, and Tristan, uh, tell, us, tell us about your project and how, uh, what you're finding. Well, yeah, the, the project kind of uh, uh, starts with the oil and gas industry, the offshore oil and gas industry um, here in Louisiana and how that was, you know, kind of like an original breakthrough for the community in the 1940s. Um, you know, how it, it, was, it was a real job creator, creator and, and wealth creator in, in, in the state. And it really, you know, kind of lifted people out of poverty um, it offered dependable jobs for the first time in Louisiana with benefits and things like that. Um, but all that's fading now, you know, with the fracking boom and, and gas prices the way they are. And, you know, it's, it's like you were saying about people standing in line waiting for that dream to happen. It's, it's definitely happening in Louisiana where, you know, people are really kind of waiting for those great oil jobs to come back. But you know, they just, they just really aren't. So there is this sort of, you know, looking for what's next, what else can we do? And, you know, the offshore wind industry is, is rising, it's growing, and it offers kind of a lifeline for those same, you know, people, the, that same kind of workforce. And, um, you know, there's not this sense that it's really going to replace oil and gas, but it is already providing jobs here. Um, it is already, you know, kind of kind of creating something out of out of something that's disappeared that that welders can do and shipbuilders and engineers, that sort of thing. And there's just, you know, a, a lot of growth potential for that. And, uh, you know, potential here in Louisiana to have an industry that is more of a solution to climate change than something that's, you know, kind of like a major contributor to it. Yeah. And do you find you're asked, well, how many jobs uh, can alternative energy give us? How many? You know, what what do you say? Yeah, it's 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 a big unknown. I mean, nobody really knows. There's been some studies that have kind of looked at, you know, what would one offshore wind farm do in Louisiana? How many jobs and things like that? And, you know, with a lot of these things, there's a big boom in construction jobs, and those are only temporary. Um, but if there's kind of a critical mass, you know, this, this kind of thing where they're just being built um, as they, it looks like they will be on the East Coast, it could be, you know, a real job cre creator. Right. Are they curious? They, they say, hey, look, Denmark has the largest wind farm and these huge big things. Uh, people don't mind looking out at blades. Uh, uh, doesn't destroy their view. Uh, are they curious or suspicious? I mean, do they feel? You know, it's, it's kind of funny. They don't really know about it right now. You know, the people that know about it are, are these guys in the oil and gas industry who you know, spent decades building ships and everything like that, and, and they are on board. And some of those companies co have completely shifted the focus of their business to these sorts of offshore wind enterprises. But it's, it's still pretty early for Louisiana. It's, it's something that hasn't really been, you know, publicly discussed very much. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, it's a different story from the one Melba is telling of people that know <laughs> that uh, Purdue is got its own interests and they are not yours, uh, and uh, but feel helpless and don't feel like external help is advancing the topic. But you've got people that uh, they were just confused. They see they are sinking. And in all of these stories, I mean, we're, we're facing a situation of loss and loss is a little harder than deprivation emotionally that the studies show us that if you had something you're losing it 
you hang on, you're more anxious than if you never have it. So, and the politicians are uh, absolutely alert to this. That is, you know, they're prospecting. <laughs> the politicians are emotional prospectors. And they're in essence trying to get the sense of, of uh, loss and confusion and fear uh, on their side. So in a way I see all of us as saying, wait a minute, <laughs> not so fast. Those feelings are there and we're addressing them, but here are these other better answers. Well, this is wonderful. Laura, do you uh, have, do we have time for more? Or? Yes, we do actually. Yeah. Well, um, so I guess what I would love to throw out to all of you is what you see as as next steps. I mean, we're in a process here. We're faced with this conflict. It's getting, climate's getting worse, but so is populist opposition to solutions. And um, where do you see the opportunities uh, for um, getting ourselves out of this fix? I can I can go. I um I had an event on Tuesday night with a number of the sources that I interviewed for my project, and so we had conventional farmers at the table, and we had some people who work in sustainable agriculture. Um, so they generally coming to the table with different philosophies and approaches. Um, also, an agronomist was there um, who works with conventional farmers, and someone from the Nature Conservancy. And I asked them what they thought was coming next, you know, what's hopeful. And, and they pointed to the fact that they're already working together um, in coalitions when it comes to conservation practices. Um, part of it has to do with that economic incentive, um, the carbon markets and agriculture, but also um, those practices that I was talking about earlier, they have benefits directly to farmers. They can help them in, increase their yields. They reduce erosion. Um, so there's, there's benefits as well, even if they don't get a big payment from um, Amazon or Microsoft or whichever company is paying into the carbon market. So people in Minnesota, at least, and Minnesota is, is purple. We're a purple state. We're not, we're not bright blue like some people might think. Um, there's, there's people from different different corners of, of the field coming together and working together on these things that will have a big impact on adapting to climate change and hopefully mitigating it too. Are these big farmers? Um, I talked to a range, so a number of small ones, but also I spent some time on a farm with 4,000 acres. They, it was like a four generation farm and the, the two youngest, their cousins, um, they just, they, one of, one of them tried a field of cover crops and it was hugely successful. They ha had not been producing, um, and they tried it one season and it turned it around and they've been experimenting for the last four years and they've seen increases in yield. They don't even care if they get, um, carbon market payments. They're doing it because they like seeing more biodiversity on their land. They like seeing something green in the ground even after they harvest their crops. They like seeing deer come and earthworms in the soil because before they were just, their soil was degraded through these practices of you know, monocropping and not having a lot of diversity there. Um, but when you start to introduce these sustainable um, practices, you, that comes back right. and it's, it's been really gratifying for them. And I, I, their, their grandpa, their grandpa and their parents didn't really want to talk to me for the story, but they're supporting, um, the two cousins and experimenting with these practices. So in a way, what you're saying, and maybe this goes, uh, for, for all of you, you're discovering that there's a way to say to the people uh, you're talking to, you are the original environmentalist. You are, you know, and I found that too in my work in Louisiana, you know, if they could hear the song of a tree toad and how it was different from a different kind of toad. I mean, they were tuned in and, uh, uh, and, and you can appeal
appeal to that, um, to say yeah. I'm already ahead of us. And they often will say that to me. They look, we we were the original conservationists. We, you know, uh, recycled our plastic things or in the 1950s that there used to be milk bottles that were glass and you recycled them as part of uh, before the plastic interests that kind of uh, took things a different way. So they feel criticized um, in a way that where they should be praised. Let me um, ask you this. Do you find that it's where do you find credible communicators on the other side? That is people who who get it, <laughs> who are part of the population that doesn't get it. You know, I would in in my reporting in Eastern North Carolina, it's becoming clear that I think the people who are just like opposing have to, they realize they've got to come up with something better for, for a long time. They, whenever there would be complaints about the uh, hog industry, they would just say, put down the bacon or shut up, you know, like, but that, you know, you, that, that will only take you so far because people are realizing um, you have to, you know, that's just telling people to shut up about their problem isn't working as it becomes more and more prevalent. So what some are doing is like, for instance, um, Smithfield did a partnership to do offer a renewable energy, you know, solution. They, they're doing biogas, turning the hog waste into uh, biofuel. Now that's a start and an acknowledgement that something needs to be done. It's also quite a bit of greenwashing too, because it's not really an environmental solution to, to the problem that's there. But at least that's a step of people on the other side saying, we have to have a better argument than just shut up and to show that there is, you know, environmental degradation, we can move, you know, we can do a little better than that. So I find that at least, a bit encouraging. Right. And could you get someone at Smithfield to say, okay, this is greenwashing, but uh, I, I want to carry it further? Have you? No, they don't say that. They, they, you know, I send them a list of 10 specific questions once and they got back to me. Oh yeah, we'll answer all your questions, but it wasn't. They sent me back a press release essentially because like the very specific questions were like, we're capturing methane. And I say, you create the methane to capture it because the process, you, methane is only created when you tarp the, the, um, the lagoons. And so that's like saying, okay, uh, I'm going to create something that doesn't exist. And then you need to thank me for reducing that thing that I created in the first place. And so, yeah. <laughs> That's kind of how that conversation went, yeah. Yeah, is there some leadership on the environment in the churches? Among in, the workers? And, in, in, you know, it's becoming more of an issue, like, uh, in Black churches, talking about those things because, you know, one pastor, they had noticed they can't even drink their water anymore. The water, they put notice from the state saying your water isn't safe to drink, and they're surrounded by these uh, spray field operations and these hog farms. So they talk about this as a justice issue. Yeah. Good. But I'll let someone else weigh in on that, too. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, uh, Dustin, you, uh, you, am I right that you were a coal miner at one point? Is that wrong? Yeah, yeah. I, I, what help you? I hold coal <laughs> in the coal mines. I've, I've worked a couple of summers as a college summer hire in the coal mines. My dad was a coal miner for 33 years. Um, before I went to college, I, I worked as kind of a, a service uh, mechanics helper and got to visit all the coal mines across the state and then some um, and, and out in the oil field. 
so as an energy reporter, that's always given me a, a good starting point to have. Yes, a call. absolutely. What do people say to you when when you say, "Oh, hey, I'm, <laughs> I know what I'm talking about here, and I've I've shared this experience." And do they, how do they respond to you? Well, like I said, it, so I, a, a lot of folks in, in Wyoming are, are really kind of uh, leery of you know, the news media, or <laughs> and you know we we get a lot of. Uh, national reporters that parachute into Wyoming every once in a while. And so um, it, it's just a good starting point to, to say that, you know, um, we're, we're both familiar with this area in the industry. Um, let's have a conversation. And I would say kind of going back to, you know, like who are some of maybe kind of the curious folks on the other side in, in Wyoming, that might be a lot of our service industry that grew up around oil and gas and then adapted to serve the coal mining industries too. And they're a lot more open to adapting to manufacturing and they're really open to technology and just kind of, you know, adding more automated systems and, and those types of jobs. Uh, you know, we have uh, a, a company in Gillette that they said that if, if the coal mines go away, they'll still be in business and they won't have to lay off anybody because uh, you know, they have a clientele now that reaches across North America and really across the world. So there's a lot of opportunity, I think, in that service industry that, you know, that grew up around oil and gas and mining to maybe make those adaptations in the market. But um, really, I th one of the next things we need to do, and I, it's starting to happen in Wyoming, is engage young people. In the state. Uh, we had a long history of young people, you know, our, our young people you know, going to school here and then leaving, uh, going to Denver for different jobs and, you know, opportunities. Um, and I would say that these days it's a lot more difficult for young people to, you know, move to another, move from Wyoming to a city. They can't, it's no longer that affordable. They're finding themselves less mobile. And so they're, and they think differently than their parents and grandparents. And I think if, if I'm gonna live in Wyoming and make my future here, well, I want good jobs. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, I, I want more job opportunities, more variety. And I also want the places I love to be healthy. Yeah. And you know, that's a real threat in Wyoming when our economy is doing poorly in Wyoming. Our leaders, are a lot more willing to sweep aside some protections for these places. Mm -hmm. So it's really important that, you know, I often tell people like, well, why care about Wyoming? Well, it's because a lot of people come here, <laughs> you know, and you know, what happens you know, to these beautiful places that people come to visit? Yeah. Um, you know, if, if our economy is doing poorly, you know, that puts those places at risk. Yeah. So a lot of people coming, but a lot of people leaving. How about the rural-urban divide? Um, uh, you know, we don't think in terms of leavers and stayers as an important sort of category of people, but uh, it is. Alex, is this uh, applying your work at all? Yeah, not, not not necessarily so much about you know the the migration patterns, but the the rural urban divide is definitely, I think that is where a you know you find commonalities among these really disparate tribes, environmental groups, uh, farmers, you know other agricultural interests in in the river basin that I cover, is that it's it's really unique because it's almost entirely rural. The largest city is like 40,000 people. Um, it's, a, it's a really remote corner of both California and Oregon, and neither population feels like either of those states represent them. So it's a, it almost has its own political identity that then um, you know, joins these disparate groups together. And I think that that's a lot of the reason why there is a potential for you know, a, a lasting solution to the water crisis and why these stakeholders were already able to come up with one 10 years ago that was unfortunately not passed by Congress. 
Um, but that's, you know, that's not to say that there aren't still some, uh, you know, issues there. I think, I think rural people, you know, they, they feel like blamed a lot for every problem that, you know, people in cities are dealing with, you know, uh, you know, our food is full of chemicals and your, you know, your cows are, uh, you know, pump, you know, pumping methane into the atmosphere and, and all this stuff. And I think, you know, if you look at, you know, if we were to take the carbon footprint of the Klamath River Basin, like it, it would be minuscule compared to any, you know, name a corporation, right? And I think that's why I really wanted to approach this from the adaptation side of things, because yes, obviously everybody has something to contribute in terms of reducing emissions and working toward that systemic change that needs to happen in order to halt climate change. But you know, we're already seeing the impacts now. And like, we have to, you know, sort of create that safety net for our communities to be able to bear the brunt of just these cascading disasters that are already occurring and are just going to get worse in the future. Um, and so that was, you know, I think that the adapt focusing on the adaptation side was really helpful in terms of just getting people to talk about climate change. Because as soon as I would mention it, you know, they would be like, oh, you know, like, why, why should I have to like deal with Governor Newsom's uh, telling me that I have to get a new truck every three years because my current one, I only drive 3000 miles on, but it's, you know, it's not electric. So it's bad for the environment. And, you know, they feel like, you know, having to switch to these new technologies or whatnot, it's a lot harder for these rural communities. They don't, they don't have the resources to do that um, compared to, you know, maybe if you have a city uh, or an organized uh, institution there that, that's making it happen for them. So what they find is that their dilemmas uh, aren't being heard. Uh, there are edicts coming from on high. And isn't this the area where this talk of the state of Jefferson? Exactly. We'll see yeah. and have our own government and we'll make our own rules and can keep our trucks for as long as we want. <laughs> Um, and uh, be be rural people. Um, so in a way- so Arlen, just so you know, we have time for maybe one more question before we move to Q general Q&A. Okay. Well, um, if each of you had one, um, wanted to throw out kind of one suggestion that would make it, uh, that would clear the way uh, across this divide um, but, uh, and make climate change feel palpable, work against it, a good thing, what would that be? Uh, let's uh, start with you, Tristan. Um, I think one thing is just to find the people who are directly affected, who are living it, you know, the people who are, um, you know, feeling the effects of flooding on a chronic basis. What does that mean for getting to work? What does that mean for getting, you know, the kids on the school bus? Um, that sort of thing. I think finding those local solutions that people can identify with, they know that town, they know that community, they know that neighborhood, they've driven through it, and they can imagine what it must be like to live with those climate effects, I think is, it's compelling and it's more effective for readers. Yeah, and Louisiana in particular, I'm thinking Lake Charles has just been transformed by storms. So yeah. you came in talking about storms. Yeah. Um, my favorite. Yeah, Nora. Um, I would say um, just try to be sensitive to the fact that um, as Kyle was just, or as Alex was just saying, um, you know, rural communities, places where there are a lot of solutions or potential for solutions, you, you can't just ask them to change on a dime without financial support or incentives. Because there, I mean, there are a lot of solutions to be found in natural and working lands. Um, but you just, I mean, you, you can't just ask people to change how they do everything just like that. And, and, and you can't assume that they don't want to either. Um, so I think that there's, you know, I, I would say watch, 
watch the attitude, not, you know, for all of us, anyone who wants to see positive improvements. And also that, you know, it's not just going to be one thing that's going to be a magic, a silver bullet, you know, we're going to have to do a lot of mitigation and a lot of adaptation across industries. Watch the attitude. Melba, what would be your suggestion? My suggestion is to keep it, you know, bring it local to them and, and show them that this is not somebody else's problem. Uh, for instance, there was a, a study that showed that the young people, the teens, the high schools, they don't plan to stay there because they don't see they don't see a life for them on the coast because so much has changed. And and I would just appeal to them like you you have an investment here this matters to you and and when we have these thousand year floods every uh two years you can't get out either you are trapped in too so to show just the local impact is, is yeah. very relevant yeah. and they're your children that will be leaving and you don't want that yeah good um dustin yeah, I, I guess I would encourage folks in Wyoming to uh, talk to one another about these places that, that we love and that we depend on and, and, and how those places are changing, uh, you know, just to make that connection uh, and, uh, you know, outside of a political discussion. And then I, I think it's really important to, to talk to young people in Wyoming and ask them, you know, what will it take for you to make your future here? You know, what do you need? What sort of- That's, that's great. Societal yeah. changes, uh, opportunities, um, and really, uh, I would like to see, you know, a lot of, <laughs> some folks who have been in, you know, positions of power for decades in Wyoming, maybe step aside and <laughs> really engage younger people more. Wonderful, wonderful. Alex. I would, I would say my number one thing would be to just take all blame off the table. Um, you know, every time you talk to climate change about, you mention climate change to somebody who's skeptical or just is not down with the whole <laughs> movement, they're, you know, they, they immediately go on the defensive and feel like they are, pers you know, you're holding them personally responsible for the crisis. And, you know, it doesn't matter how many burgers you eat, how many plane flights you take. Like, if you just lived in the woods for the rest of your life, never emitted a single, uh, you know, ton of carbon for the rest of, you know, your living days, the world would still be, you know, a screwed up place. So that that alone is proof that it's not one individual person's fault. You know, you really have to take a, a broader perspective and explain to folks that this is really a systemic problem that, you know, we all have a role in solving it and building a better future, but it's nobody, you know, the blame should not be put on any one person. Put the sociology back into it. Back <laughs> to you, Laura. Wow, what an incredible conversation. Um, okay, so talk to the people who are impacted the most, watch the attitude, make it local, Talk to each other, especially young people, and take all blame off the table. Those are some pretty sweet takeaways. So thank you so much for, for those. Okay, great. We have a pretty lively chat and set of Q&As or set of questions here that have been submitted. Um, so let's jump into one. So um, the, one of the questions that we asked is, you know, early, early in your conversation, you were talking about listening and when you did try to persuade it didn't go very well. The question is, well, ultimately, don't we want to persuade uh, when it comes to, you know, don't we actually want to convince people about climate change? So how do we best do that? Okay, then when you're listening to how people hear, you are learning how to persuade. And um, one way, for example, uh, to persuade is to, uh, speak to their own values. I talked to a man who worked in oil all his life. And um, uh, he said, uh, um, well, I, uh, you know, I really love the military. 
and I'm against uh, all of this climate change thing. And I could say, you know, who's really out front in uh, climate change and who's done a lot with uh, solar and wind and uh, that's uh, the military. And actually they know, in other words, that America's safety requires uh, really focusing on climate change. And I saw a kind of a loosening of the jaw and, you know, he'd been in the military and yeah, his sector was really leading the way. That's an example of persuasion through listening to uh, his values. Another would, people would say, well, I worked at uh, BP or Exxon, you know, big companies, no, no, no such thing as climate change. Well, look at the websites of those big companies. They all talk about the reality of climate change. Right? And uh, so find, um, in addition to that, find credible communicators. Maybe they're not gonna listen to you. Oh, you Berkeley professor, okay, fine. Find someone in their world who gets it and refer to them. Let them do it, let them carry the ball. This, I think, these are ways of persuasion. And I think we make mistake to think that listening is just listening. It's this, you know, you actually could make it worse because you're giving them some credibility for their denial. No, no, no. You're picking up tricks. It's a reconnaissance trick. I love that. P picking up tricks. Um, well, you're, you're learning how to speak into the listening, right? Speaking into the way that they hear. Okay, so we have a question coming in. Um, perhaps this is a good one from Melba and for Professor Hochschild. So a popular framework for confronting climate change is environmental justice, like the focus of your project, Melba, fixing harms that date back generations or have racial divisions. So how do we pursue those topics with audiences who have that line cutter viewpoint that these victims are benefiting at our expense? So I'm thinking, Melba, about you know you you interacted a lot with the the people who are being impacted by this community. What does the other side think about these issues? Or have you found ways to to have conversations with them about it? You know, I in Arlie and I had this kind of conversation a few months ago, and then you, Laura, as well, as. I, I need to listen to Arlie more because about listening to other people more because when I listen, all I hear is, it, you know, is I don't care. I just don't believe it. And it is not my problem. And these are line cutters. And, and so the people who feel are lying, you know, line cutters, okay. And how long have black people been in this country? Yeah. But Still, and who's are, cutting in line? <laughs> we're, we're cutting the line and we've been here, the vast majority of us through uh, no, fa no fault or whatever, you know, of our own. Or, and so still, when there's anything that's advanced, we're looked at, the line cutters looked at as line cutters just because when, when someone says, someone said to me one time that when you're accustomed to privilege, equality feels like oppression. So to make everybody equal, they it's not about putting someone ahead of you, but to put them on par with you. Some people are greatly, you know, like offended by that. And I just don't know how you get to someone who just their position is, I don't care. I don't care. And so, like I said, I, I always like to listen to Arlie because then and you too, Laura, for talking me down. <laughs> I really hope that there's a way to uh, reach that segment because yeah. I haven't found it. Um, so what I would uh, <laughs> add to Melba's uh, statement, and I understand it can feel hopeless when you're starting at scratch, is that actually we need new vehicles new structures through which to have these conversations. And uh, we used to have uh, labor unions and compulsory draft that mixed and matched, you know, urban, rural, white, black, class, social class, upper, lower. And 
we don't have that anymore. And we need to make up new ones. And uh, I think uh, through uh, the church, through schools, uh, there is something called the Bridge Alliance in the United States that <laughs> it's an umbrella group over some 70 or 80 kind of pop-up groups like living room conversations, which I've participated with. You, you get Republicans, Democrats, pro and con <clears throat> environmental uh, concerns, and uh, you're intentional. And uh, I think those are a better start and that you again uh, see who the the credible communicators are on the other side and you go to them and how can i help you uh, and uh so i think that uh, actually melba's right if you're taking the extreme extreme yeah uh, okay don't don't start there but if you go in the middle uh I think there is wiggle room, guilt out of the story. This is good for you too. This is good for us all. Uh, if we pick the population, get the right vehicles and um, have a, a guilt-free but aimed purposeful conversation, there's actually at this juncture in history, I think uh, some important wiggle room. So I just want to briefly acknowledge the time. I know it's a quarter past, and we said that we would end this um, a quarter past, but I'm actually going to, our, our guests today have said that they're available to stay for a few more minutes. And I hope that our attendees here are also available to stay for a few more minutes. I really want to get at least a couple of questions in. So please stick with us. But of course, if you have to go, we understand. So uh, next question came in. It says, Nora's comment about the difficulties of asking for radical change to happen all at once is a very good one. The problem is, of course, the need to transition to a clean future very quickly um, because, you know, we've waited so long to take action on climate change. So how do we how do we balance these two things? How do we balance the fact that we need to urgently act on climate change, but then also we need to be able to bring people along, especially people who are asking to change, and that might not happen overnight. So Nora, do you have some thoughts for that? And then maybe some of the other fellows have thoughts on that too. I do think that there is a sense of urgency that people are aware of or, or coming to terms with that this decade is very crucial for taking action on climate change. and. I think the more of these coalitions that I mentioned that are coming together, that means more conversations where, um, you know, an understanding that climate change is happening, that's foundational to the conversation and the partnerships. I feel like that, that will help accelerate coalition building and action by those coalitions and perhaps also political pressure because you, you need money to do this. I mean, I think everybody knows that you probably need public money. We're going through that discussion in Congress, but you also need mark money from the market. And you also, you know, you also need to make sure that um, you also need oversight and that kind of thing. So there's, there's a lot of things changing, but those solutions and those mechanisms are out there. California has been trying them. Other countries have been trying them. It's not like we're flying blind. Um, so I, my, I, I am an intentionally optimistic person and I feel like there is momentum and like there is urgency right now. Um, certainly there will be people um, blocking the way and um, hopefully, Hopefully they will not win the day. <laughs> Hopefully we can have, you know, the momentum to move past those people and to really take this seriously. Any other fellows want to make a comment, Tristan? I saw you well, unmuted yourself, which is like the equivalent yeah. of raising your hand. Um, I think here in Louisiana, there isn't a sense of urgency to to combat climate change. You know, there's. I mean, we do have a, a governor who who talks a lot about it. Um, we have kind of a rare, you know, Democrat governor in, in a deep South state, but, you know, he's going to be out of office soon. And, 
you know, that discussion just isn't really at that level with that topic of, of climate change. But I think that the effects of climate change people are constantly talking about. And if there is a sense of urgency, it's, it's in that, like we need to, to do things to cope with, you know, the increasing rainfall, we need to do things that um, basically adapt to the state to, to what's coming. But, you know, unfortunately not so much about, you know, reducing the root cause. I can also jump into that. I think it's also kind of about just changing our expectations of like how we want the future to look like. I think, you know, this kind of idea of constant growth as a measure of success is sort of evidently not working anymore. Um, and, you know, I think communities have to decide what sustainability and viability into the future looks like for them. And I think for a lot of them, it's not going to be measured by, you know, how much food you export or how much money you make or how big your economy is. It's going to be something different. And I think, you know, just trying to say that, you know, incorporating the, you know, the environmental surroundings, nature into all of that is, is going to be a big part of that. And I think, you know, the, going back to, I guess, the central question of, uh, you know, forcing solutions onto people before they're ready or before, you know, they can have the capacity to, to ramp it up is, um, I think, you know, nobody wants to be forced to do anything, but I think if you frame it in a way that's like, look at, you know, look at what we have here and look at the people that we have in these communities and like how they all care about their neighbors and their homelands and, you know, where they, you know, where they go to school, where they go for hikes and all that stuff, you know, you do have a lot of passion for wanting to continue like a, you know, a livable place for these people. So I think, you know, and people want to be part of the solution, I mean, you know, especially with the farmers who right now have sort of just been slowly chipped at for the last two decades. And, you know, many family farms are going under they want, they want to be part of the solution. They want to, you know, they don't want to just be cut off from the rest of the system. They want to, help, you know, they're like, can we help? What, what are ways that we can help and spend money on something other than lawyers to sue each other? And, um, you know, I, I, think, I think you will find that there's people who, who want to be part of the solution. And those, those are who, you know, whose voices should be amplified. Yeah. Let me just uh, add that in Louisiana, there's this thing, the Cajun Navy, which has come in heroically to help people in floods and they get uh, um, boats out and rescue people from their rooftops. And uh, what if, uh, and they're very proud to be you know, cross-racial that they'll rescue whoever's in trouble, but they not a word about climate change. What if they were to say, you know, hey, we're the heroes, you know, in, in uh, fighting this. I think we have to think about pride and heroism and uh, uh, tune into that and uh, help people see that they could be heroes on the other side. Well, uh, I'm very sorry to have to end our conversation here. Um, there were a lot of other really good questions in the chat, including things about political polarization and how this relates to COVID and vaccinations and um, persuading people and how you get better at listening. But unfortunately, we don't have time to go through all of those today. Um, I just want to say a, a big thanks and congratulations again to our five journalism fellows. And also uh, thank you to Professor Arlie Hochschild for joining us as our special guest today and also in, in supporting our fellows and being a kind of pseudo mentor for them um, through a conversation we had earlier in the year. Um, for those who are tuning in to stay up to date about our work in this area, you can sign up for our MIT Environmental Solutions Initiative newsletter. That's esi.mit.edu, you can sign up there. And if you'd like to contribute to next year's journalism fellowship, you can visit esi.mit.edu/slash donate or email me. You can get me at climate or climate at climate at mit.edu. 
We appreciate everybody's questions and attention today, but most of all, your commitment to real and meaningful action on climate change that includes everyone and makes everyone a hero. So thank you and have a good rest of your day. Take care.